these next five weeks, what I want to do is I want to get into a series that I simply wanted to title Jesus. But after prayer and deliberation and after seeking the face of the Lord uh, and, and more, more than anything else, looking forward and preparing four weeks in advance, uh, I came up with the title, Following Jesus, Following Jesus. Uh, that's the subject and that's the topic that we will be dwelling on over the next five weeks. Uh, if you have a person that needs to hear about Jesus, bring them on Sunday morning. It's going to be amazing. Lives are going to be changed. Lives are going to be transformed. And I can assure you of that. Follow is a very common term that is used in our world, which is uh, probably today governed by uh, the rules of social media, probably. Uh, the word follow is very loosely used, if you ask me. You follow people on Instagram, on Twitter, on various forms of social media. Following people on Twitter is easy. It's not a difficult thing at all. You set up an account, uh, hit a few buttons, and you're instantly connected to what people are thinking, what they are saying, and what they're doing around the world. You are thus a follower of that person. Uh, and that's what the word follow means in today's culture. Uh, you not only get to see what they are saying and doing, but you can also uh, share all of this by retweeting their thoughts and comments with your followers. So not only are you following people, but there are people that are interested in your life as well. Uh, Twitter, uh, the, the person that has the most amount of Twitter followers, I'm said in the billions, is Katy Perry, uh, the singer. Um, and Barack Obama comes next, President Barack Obama comes next, and then uh, you have a, a bunch of characters that follow. Uh, and a lot of people follow them. They want to know what they're up to. They want to know what they had for a lunch. The idea of someone eating kale is exciting for some people. They follow them religiously because they want to know what they are up to, right? Uh, and and I'm, I'm telling you, follow, following people on Twitter is easy. Uh, which is why uh, you can follow hundreds of people all at the same time. Uh, just scrolling down, you can follow this and this and this and this. You can follow everybody. There are people that I follow on Twitter and on Instagram. I follow uh, a person by the name of A.W. Tozer. Uh, I, I follow uh, a person by the name C.S. Lewis. And the crazy thing is both these people are dead and gone. But somebody somewhere in America or somewhere in the world behind their computer have opened an account under their name. And they do it in right reasons. They post quotes, uh, things from them that they have said that have been remarkable. And I follow them because those quotes mean something to me. They lift me up when I'm having a bad day. They help me out in my sermon preparation. Following a sports team is easy. You can watch them play. You can celebrate when they win. You can cry when they lose. But it's easy is what I'm trying to tell you. It might cost you some money if you buy tickets to watch them play in person or purchase merchandise to show their support, but, uh, but, but it's easy just to go on Twitter and follow them to see what they're up to. So social media has romanticized this whole idea of following, so to speak. They make following so easy, but what I'm here to tell you today is the opposite is true for the Christian. As the world wants you to understand the concept of following is not the way Jesus would want you to understand the concept of following. This is not going to be a popular message. It's not going to be a message that people jump up and down enjoy. I'm not going to hear a lot of amens and I'm not going to hear a lot of preach, pastor, preach. And that's totally okay. This is probably a message series that will pierce through hearts that will dive into people's souls that will put people in reality check mode. And that is what I desire as a pastor of this church, is that we as a congregation, as a body of believers, will try with everything we have to strive towards where God wants us to be and not our romanticized idea of what Christianity is all about. In Luke chapter 4 verse 18, we catch Jesus in, this, in the beginning of his ministry. And in verse number 18, the Bible says this, you can follow with me in your Bibles, and I encourage you guys every other day, every other Sunday, make sure you bring your Bibles, bring a note, notebook, write your notes. It, it might can be on your phone, it could be on a notepad, whatever it is. These notes help you in your everyday Christian life. 
This is, what, this is what the Bible says. Is, this is Luke's account. One day as Jesus was walking along the shores of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, also called Peter, and Andrew. They were throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. They were fishermen. Verse 19, Jesus called out to them and said, Come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people, or in the Christian terminology as we have come to know it, he called them to be fishers of men. Verse 20, and they left their nets at once and followed him. This will be our key verse over the next few weeks. And they left their nets at once immediately and followed him. Verse 21, a little further up the shore, he saw two other brothers, James and John, sitting in a boat with their father Zebedee, repairing their nets. And he called them to come too. They immediately followed, followed him, leaving the boat and their father behind. Verse 23, Jesus traveled throughout the region of Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news of the kingdom. And he healed every kind of sickness and disease and illness. Uh, he healed the sick, verse 24. People were being healed. The demon possessed were being set free. The epileptic or the paralyzed. He healed them all, the Bible says. Verse 25, large crowds followed him wherever he went. People from Galilee, the ten towns, Jerusalem, from all over Judea, and from the east of the Jordan River. And if you look geographically, this is a pretty wide area that people have started hearing about, G about Jesus and what he's doing within a short period of time. Now I'm going to make a statement that may seem or may, that may sound paradoxical in nature, but by the end of this message, I am hoping that this statement will make sense to a lot of you. All right? And here's the statement. Jesus had people that followed him, and he also had people that followed him. Bear with me. This will make sense in a little bit. And my question to you as I start this message this morning and the series this morning is, are you following him or are you following him? The first followers of Jesus, as the Bible tells us, was Simon and Andrew, who were two brothers. And it was James and John, who were also two brothers. There were four fishermen, as the Bible tells us, on the, uh, on the, on, on the, the sea line uh, of Galilee. And, uh, and, and they, they fished all the way to uh, Capernaum. Simon, who also became Peter and Andrew, uh, and, and, and James and John were uh, people that were fishermen. And they worked together on the same stretch of shoreline, if I may. Because Jesus encounters them in very close proximity to one another. And probably they fished in the same waters. They probably went out on the same fishing expeditions. They probably knew each other. And as Jesus walked along the Sea of Galilee, he called out to them and he said, follow me. In the, in the little Greek translation, if you look at the words that Jesus used, it was not, hey guys, I'm, I'm about to set on a mission. Do you guys want to come with me? No, 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 it's not that. It was literally Jesus looking at them, and if I, I don't want to use this word bark in a crude way, but the words that were used by Jesus was more of a barking tone where he said, here now, come. Here now, come. These were the three words, here now, come. And the Bible says they left their boats and they followed him. And John and James went one step further. They were fishing with their father. They said, adios, goodbye, see you later. No, I, we, it's not our intention to hurt you. And we'll talk about this in a second. And they said goodbye to their father, left everything that they had, and they followed Jesus. While it seems like following Jesus was the easy thing for them to do, it was not. I want you to take a few moments to think about what they had to give up in order to make that biggest decision that they were about to make. In a nutshell, they had to give up their profession. They had to give up their families. They had to give up their business because one person came along and he said, follow me right now. True followers of Jesus are not listeners and observers. They are disciples. Throughout this sermon series, we're going to be focusing on what true discipleship is means what does it mean to follow Jesus if time permits I want to go over three points today the first point is in order to follow Jesus 
you and I as Christians must have radical obedience. Someone say radical obedience. The Bible says Peter and, uh, Peter and Andrew left their nets and they followed Jesus. As fishermen, that was their livelihood. It was how they provided for their families. It was how they put food on the table and even helped care for and feed the people of their community. That's exactly, and, and the fishermen back in the day were people who who'd not just fed their own families, but they would take a fish and they would give it to this family in need and that family in need or their relatives or their parents. They were there to provide for the community as a whole. The fishermen in that day were known as people that lifted up their community. They were the small businesses of that day. They were the ones that went into any community and made them prosper and thrive. They provided for them. The Greek word uh, translated as follows is, is the mo in most of these references that the Bible talks about follow is this word okulutho, okulutho, which is translated as follow. In other occurrences in the Bible, there's a broader range of meanings which can also mean accompany or assist. If we understand this word in its truest form, Jesus is not just calling people to say, hey, tag along. I want to look good, so I want a crowd of people. I want a bunch of people that I can put on my Instagram feed and I can put on my Facebook wall. I want to look at people and show them that I have people following me. It wasn't a, hey, tag along with me. It was much more of a compelling message than that. Jesus didn't want people to just listen and believe in him from a distance. He always invited people to come, to join him, and even help him in this mission that his father in heaven had sent him on as a church as commissioned church the one thing that we want to know and we want to drill into our minds and we want to adopt is the fact that we are not just building numbers we want to build disciples that can follow Jesus even till the end of time it is my desire as a pastor that we don't just have photo ops. We don't have people show up just for the sake of people showing up. We're not a church about numbers. I, we're a church about souls. And we want to make sure that as a church, we make disciples and not people. He wanted people to be vitally engaged with him. Learning and doing. There's nothing passive about being a true follower of Jesus Christ. You cannot be a true follower. You cannot be a Christian and be a passive at the same time. Being a Christian means fully devoted, fully given out, fully sold out to this Jesus that we profess and talk about. Jesus made the word follow popular way before Instagram and Twitter did. When you follow someone, it, makes, it means you make an effort to track their life and, and what they have to say. You follow someone on Twitter when you are interested in what they have to say, like I said. But here's the difference between a Jesus follower and a Twitter follower. You don't have a personal relationship with Katy Perry or Barack Obama or President Donald Trump. But man, when you follow Jesus, it's not a button that you click. It is a relationship that you get into. Following Jesus means God... You have my heart. You have my everything. I have you. I have your everything. And that is all that I need, God. That is what it means by following Jesus. It means being in close proximity with the one that saved you. It's not a distant relationship. It cannot be a relationship of, I know Jesus, I know of Jesus. It's not a relationship of, I've heard of Jesus. I come to Sunday, Sunday services and I hear about Jesus. Being a true follower of Jesus Christ means all out, all in, giving your life to Jesus and saying, God, you have all of me, every single detail. And in obeying Jesus, they, they, they probably have heard of him. They've probably seen him over the last 30 years getting prepared for ministry or whatnot. But at the mention of, hey, come, follow, the Bible says they leave everything and follow. Sheer obedience, radical obedience. How many of us practice radical obedience in our Christianity? 
You know, in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 13, you know what the Bible says? And I took this from the NIV as opposed to the NLT. But the Bible says this, leaving Nazareth, he went and he lived in Capernaum. The Bible says he left his hometown. He himself left before he asked other people to leave. He himself obeyed his father in heaven. He left his father and mother back at their house and he said, guys, I've been here for 30 years, but today there is a new calling. It is a new season in my life that I need to go ahead in, that I need to push myself in and I can't hold back anymore. He leaves his comfort zone. He leaves his home. He leaves his surroundings. He leaves his familiarity. He leaves his lazy boy and he says, God is calling me to something bigger. I can't just see here for the rest of my life he says I gotta go and I gotta go what and do what God is calling me to do so he leaves before he asks them to leave and follow he himself leaves his hometown he models for them radical obedience is when we have no prob- problem in abandoning what we value that is only temporal to embrace what he promises which is eternal what are you embracing today what are you valuing today what is of importance in your life today are you following things in your life that are temporal that go within a period of time and we'll talk about that in just a second or are you putting your emphasis and are you prioritizing your time your efforts, and everything you have on God Almighty. Following Jesus means radical obedience. Following Jesus means radical sacrifice. Luke chapter 4 and verse 22, the Bible says, they immediately followed him, leaving the boat and their father behind. Come on now. When someone makes a decision to follow Jesus... It is impossible to live an unchanged life. When you make the decision to leave everything and say, God, I want to follow you. Remember, it's not going to be that same life. And there are some drastic changes that have to happen in your life. You can't have both your feet in two boats. It, it, it has to be. In, you got to let go of one in order to be able to enjoy and be able to, to enjoy what God is doing in your life at that moment. The Bible says he leaves their father in the boat. It's so significant for various reasons. And you got to understand this from a Middle Eastern standpoint. From an Indian background, it is easy for me to understand this the more I think about this. Because here are two sons following in their father's footsteps. Here are two sons that have the father's business. And here is a father that has been dreaming for his children. And oftentimes in the Middle Eastern culture... The, 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 the kids often follow after their father's work and father's business. And the father is usually the one that dreams for them and formulates their dreams, formulates their future. And here they are in the middle of their dream, in the middle of what they think is their destiny, in the middle of what God is going to pass down to them from their father. And here they are struggling in the midst of it, right? And God looks at them and says, guys, I'm taking you out of here. So they look at the father and say, dad, I'm sorry, but I know you have dreams for me. I know you have aspirations for us. I know that you're going to hand down this business to us sometime. But this call is a pretty compelling call that we just cannot ignore when James and John made the decision to follow Jesus as his disciples their decision forever changed their lives and God uses them to change the course of history because of that do you know that your decision to follow Jesus Christ could make an impact on history I am telling you You cannot see it yourself. And John and James were not going to see that themselves, but the decision to follow Jesus had an influence on their destiny. If you look at Luke chapter 9, verse 23 to 25, I don't go there real quick, and I want to study that real quick. And, And this is what the Bible says. Then he said to the crowd, Jesus said to the crowd, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross daily, and you need to follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what you do, and what do you benefit if you gain the whole world, but you yourself are lost or destroyed? Following means not that we walk behind Christ. 
but rather that we walk in the same path that he took. We walk the road of submission. We walk the road of sacrifice. We walk the road of service. And it's not a one-time decision to follow Christ. A lot of us have this mis- it's, it's not, oh, I followed Christ. I, I made the decision to accept Christ in my heart. He's, he's tucked away right in there. I have no problem. He's, he's all the way back there, and, and you're petting him, and you're keeping him for yourself. No, no, no. It's not a one-time decision that you make to follow Christ. You accept Christ. He's in your heart. But man, following Jesus is a daily endeavor where you deny yourself and everything else that tries to take the place of Jesus in your life. Denying it, saying no to it, and putting Jesus in the forefront of everything you do. We decide to follow Jesus and walk in his ways on a daily basis. And that's what Jesus is saying. Man, you have to take your cross. You know what C.S. Lewis says? In his book, Mere Christianity, one of my favorite books of all times, if I find in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. Guys, when, when we understand Christ in his fullness... We can't help but want him more. The things of this world, they become meaningless. The stuff of the world is important to us because we have not understood how big, how powerful, how full, how, how satisfying the power of Jesus is. They're, they should have been either foolish or crazy to have left their nets and their boats to follow a man But it's crazy, those words, follow me, resonated within their hearts. And inside of them, something told them, this Jesus is about to change my life forever. And this decision that I'm about to make is about to make me somebody that's going to change history forever. We are called to follow. The call of Jesus is rather simple, come follow me. But what's difficult is the implications. The implications are anything but simple. The call to follow is a call to a transformed life. We cannot accept the call of Christ and we can't remain the same. We can't have the old life that we live, that we go on living. Following Jesus means that we give up everything else and make him the priority of our lives. My question to you today is, are you following Jesus or are you following Jesus? It's going to make sense. What Jesus is saying is, it's very clear. He says, not my cross. He says, take up your cross. I, I took up my cross already. He did what he had to do already. It's not about what he did, it's it's about you. It's a matter of priority. It would be poor biblical exegesis to assume that based on the accounts of the first disciples that everyone who follows Jesus needs to leave every part of their life behind. And you're probably sitting over there and wondering the same, Pastor Osher, are you telling me that I need to leave my job, that I need to leave my house, that I need to leave my husband and go to Africa or go to India or go and, you know, go to wherever it is? God, are you, Pastor Osher, are you telling me that? No, 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 no. That's not what I'm I'm trying to say this isn't the case for everyone. Not everyone who follows Jesus is called to leave everything behind in order to follow him. There are some people like that. There are missionaries who are called like that. But every Christian is called to follow in their own respect. However, as far as we are concerned, we are called to make Jesus the number one priority in our life. And that will mean that we have to leave some things behind. It looks different for everyone. Some people will be called to move to a distant land, like I said. Some people are called to serve among unreached people groups so that they can share the the gospel with them. Some people are just called to put away temporary things that you focus on, that, that, that take your time, that consume your energy, that consume your family's energy, to focus more on eternal things, things that are going to make a difference in your life. And that's my question to you. Are you following Jesus? 
in that are you having this radical obedience and radical sacrifice? Following Jesus means, man, everything that is in your life that takes up your time, that consumes your energy, that consumes your family, are those things that you are aware about, that you are able to put aside? The things in your life that take priority today, are you able to put those things aside? If God looks at you and says, I need more time with you, how many of you have a very close relationship with Jesus, which which is what he wants? How many of us can feel the heartbeat of Jesus? How many of us make sure prayer is a lifestyle, not a religious activity? It is important for us to understand that prayer is what God wants to have with us. Conversation is what God, it's not a thing that we do. It's a conversation that is mandated as a Christian to have every single day with God. Number three is radical faith, radical faith, radical obedience, radical sacrifice. The third thing you and I need to follow Jesus is radical faith. Can I be open with you as a pastor? Is that okay? Some of y'all are like, oh, no, not this moment. Here's what I'm afraid about. Here's what I'm afraid about. It scares me, and I am afraid that no matter how much we do church together, and no matter how many of us are in this room that worship Jesus, I'm afraid that there are people that are sitting over here that will not be in heaven, that will go to hell. Oh, I just lost a lot of y'all. Because, man, we don't talk about that stuff. We don't talk about that stuff in our churches. That's, that's oh, Pastor Ashish, come on now. That's a line you don't cross. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's, that's something that I have to say. Following Jesus does not mean standing, because there were different people that followed Jesus. There were the disciples that left everything and stood by his side and and did everything with him and wanted to feel the heartbeat of Jesus. And they were those that just stood at a distance and was like, I've heard of this dude. I'm here to see his magic. I'm here to see what he's doing in your life. I'm I'm here to see what uh, he's up to. Uh, I'm, I'm rejoicing. I come on a Sunday morning and I'm just going to clap. I'm going to, oh, that's a good point. I'm, I'm going to listen to a sermon and I'm, I'm scared that a lot of people that do church regularly are people that are probably not going to see heaven. Like I said, it's not going to be a popular message today, guys, but here's the thing. I'm, I, I fear that many people that call themselves Christians are not really followers of Jesus Christ. And as a church, I am committed to be a pastor of this church that is a church that can be true followers of Jesus Christ. If you, and, and if that's going to cost us people and numbers and crowds, so be it. And I'm so confident telling you this. I'm not about populating a church. I'm not about filling seats. I'm not about looking our church make, you know, have a good social media presence or, or this, this PR presence. No, 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 no. For me, I care about your soul. I care about where you are going to go if Jesus comes. I care about where you will go if you die today. You know what Paul told Timothy? In the end days, people aren't going to put up with sound doctrine. They will hear what their itching ears want to hear. And you know what? We, we have a lot of people like that. We have a lot of pastors like that, but I can assure you that I'm going to disappoint you. I'm not going to be one of those pastors. When God tells me to encourage the church, I will encourage the church. When God tells me to lift their spirits up, I will lift their spirits up because I know when God tells me that the church is going through a season, but when the church needs to go through a season of being better church, being a better church, being better Christians, being refined in your faith, I'm going to step up as a pastor and do what Jesus did. I'm not going to give you messages that make you feel good. Ooh, that was tingly. And I don't care about your tingly feelings. I'm sorry. I'm just being brutally honest here. I care about your soul. And you know what? It's not just me that needs to care. You need to care about your soul. You know, Easter's coming up, right? We've been praying, like I said. We've been praying. We've been hoping. We're like, God, you know what? There there are people that that come for 
come for Easter that wouldn't come any time during the year. There are Christians that do that, and they call themselves Christians. It's a sad thing, but that's a sad thing. But we have to be prepared for those people to walk into our church, to let them know what following Jesus means. And I'm going to talk about that in just a second, but man, I've, I've, I'm excited about Easter and I've been praying and I've been asking God, God, Lord, I, what do I preach? What do I have to tell people? Because I know there's going to be more than 30 or 40 people that, that we have on a regular Sunday. I know there's going to be more, Lord. What is the right thing that I have to say so that they will come back? That's, I'm, trust me, this is my prayer. I've been praying, God, God, give me the right words to say so that they're going to, become, they, they're going to come back instead of only coming back in Christmas. And God's like, what are, you, what are you praying for, Rashish? And I was reminded, it was like God was asking me, what was Jesus' message? Uh, was Jesus' message, we're so glad you're here. Did Jesus climb up on the mountain and say, you, 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 you're a first time visitor. I'm so glad you were here. Did Jesus say, you know what, Peter, James, and John, you're going to be the first impressions ministry, and we, we have all of this, right? And that's, that's what I'm saying. That's, that's what's crazy. Is that what's going to bring us back? I wanted to have a first impressions ministry in the church. We wanted to make sure that we had people that were welcomed and, and felt belonged, but I looked at Jesus and said, man, what did Jesus have? Did Jesus ever stand up in a mountain and say, Oh, I want to welcome you with open arms. No, he, he, he said, he, did, did he say, oh man, we have this program and we have this program and this program and, and you don't want to miss next Sunday because this is the series that I'm going to be starting. Oh, your fruitful life forever. You're going to have an amazing life. Ahead. That's a series. No, no, no. He didn't say, here, here's a mug or here's a water bottle. Here's a red box code. Go and have, enjoy a movie. Welcome to our church. Jesus didn't say any of that stuff. He didn't say, bring a friend next time you come. Jesus never begged people to follow him. He said, come follow me. He didn't beg people. Never would you find in scripture where he went to somebody and said, would you please follow me? In fact, people begged him. They came up to him and said, Jesus, can I follow you? And he looked at them and said, man, uh, foxes have holes, uh, birds have nests, but the son of man does not have a pillow to sleep on. Are you sure that you want to follow me? It was not, hey, come, we want more people to come. I want more people to listen to me. I need more people to follow me, so come follow me. It was more of, and that's what I just couldn't understand Jesus. Jesus was like, are you sure this is the right pastor you have come to? And Jesus was like more turning someone off and saying, trying to convince somebody not to come to his church and not to follow him rather than to say, oh, you, 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 let's all go. Luke chapter 14, verses 25, a large crowd was following Jesus. He turned around and said to them, if you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else, your father, your mother, wife, and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life, otherwise you cannot be my disciple. I debated so much if I should bring up this verse. Because there's, there's not a good way that I've ever seen a pastor preach this verse. And I'm like, God, I'm not the best of orators. I'm not the best of speakers. I don't know how to present this without people wondering if you are a crazy God. There were so many people. The great crowd is what the Bible says. They were thronging him. They were following him. And, and Jesus says, man, you want to follow me? Go tell your dad you hate him. Oh, whoa, God. Whoa, Jesus. Does Jesus advocate hatred? Absolutely not. Jesus is using a Hebrew exaggeration when he describes our relationship with family as hatred. The issue is that Jesus is comparing the level of commitment we have with him and the level of commitment and priority that we give our family. I'll do anything for my family. I'll do anything for my wife. I'll do anything for my, for my daughter. I'll do anything for them because they mean the world to me. And Jesus is saying, where do I come in relation to that? It's not that Jesus doesn't care that your child has a cold. It doesn't, it, it's, not, it's not that he doesn't care that your relationship is suffering. Those are temporary. He says, that's good, that's great. Those are temporary. But your relationship with Jesus is eternal. 
And he's saying that is what should hold importance in your life. Follow Jesus. And in comparison, our level of love for Jesus should be so vast that it makes our love for our family members look like hate. It's like, I love you, boy, but you know what? I love Jesus more. How many parents are daring to say that? The matter is simple. Jesus wants to be first priority in our lives. Nothing, not even a family should come in between your relationship with Christ. Nothing should come into your time that you spend with Jesus. See, when we see a crowd, we want to keep the crowd. When Jesus saw the crowd, he was like, are you sure you want to listen to me? I I don't know. He He was trying to talk them out of it. In Luke chapter 14, verse 28, I'm going to close real soon here, but this is what the Bible says. But don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there is enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money, and then everyone would laugh at you. They would say there's a person who started that building and could not afford to finish it. He's saying that, 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 that don't get into this relationship. Don't follow me. Don't start this if you can't finish it. And this is important for the Christian. Following Jesus means a long-term commitment. Haven't you seen those buildings? That they started and they had the budget, but they never accounted for what goes into the building. And then it just lays there. You hate to see those buildings that are unfinished. Jesus says, I want you to think about the cost right now. If the worship team could get ready. um, I want to finish real quick and I want to get into a time of communion. You don't tell people that there's a cost. In times when we share the gospel with people, we want, to, we want people to follow Jesus, right? That's our goal. We want people to know this Jesus that we know. But here's, here's what the problem is in today's evangelism. We don't tell people the whole truth. We say, hey, you know, come to this Jesus. He's good. He's great. He's amazing. But what what, what happens is we don't tell them. We we want to do anything for the cost of one person to be saved, to be baptized. We'll do anything. Oh, we just need to baptize them. That's good. But we don't tell them what the cost is to follow Jesus. And Jesus is looking at him and saying, don't start building if you don't know what goes into it. How many of us are doing that in our lives right now? Today, we're, we're surrounded by bad teachings, man. It could be a prosperity. You can be wealthy. You can be healthy. It doesn't matter. God wants you. But, but God does not promise that. He says, man, you're going to suffer. You're going to have to go through pain. You're going to have to go through tears. But he says, I'm going to be there for you. I will sustain you is what Bible says. Guys, when we raise our children up, when we minister to our friends, don't be afraid to minister like Jesus did, to go up to them and say, you need to follow Jesus. And if that means forsaking this and to follow Jesus, that's what it means. It doesn't mean, oh, you're smoking pot on Tuesday and Thursday and Friday. Oh, it's okay. As long as you come on Sunday and worship God, that's okay. No, 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 no. It doesn't work that way. Oh, you can go partying and live a life of, you know, of, of, of whatever you live, man. But on Sunday, make sure you come to church. I won't be a pastor like that. I won't be a pastor that will encourage your, your sin behavior that you are living and encourage you and clap for you and say, oh, just come to church on Sunday. Just show up on Sunday because I need a face. No, I won't do that. I assure you, you won't do, I won't do that. I'll be the last person to tell you you can go on living that life you, and, and, and just come and show faith. No, no. We need to stop telling our children that too. Luke chapter 14 and verse 33, it says, if you do not denounce, you cannot be my disciple. You cannot. Would you stand up to your feet with me? When Jesus says, follow me, He's clearly saying two things. Not just one thing. Now listen very carefully. When he says, follow me, he's saying two things. He's saying, follow me. 
And he's also saying, follow me. You know, in normal sentence construction, there's always emphasis on a major subject in that sentence. Emphasis is always given on one major thing to make that sentence meaningful. But when Jesus says, follow me, he doesn't emphasize on follow. Neither does he emphasize on me. He emphasizes on both those words and says, follow me. You know what that means? It means that there is me. Jesus is saying there's me and there's my mission. There is a person and there is a path. There is a sweetness and there is a suffering. And he's saying both of this come hand in hand. And that's beautiful. Following Jesus may be a life filled with uncertainty. You know what Billy Graham once said? He said, salvation is free, but following Jesus will cost you everything you have. Everything you have. The greatest issue facing the world today is Christians not wanting to follow Jesus. That's the greatest issue facing our church today. Is that you, we want to be Christians. We want to do the Christian thing. We want our children to learn the Bible. We want them to learn the Christian songs. We want them to have good behavior in school. We want them to have good morals and ethics and values. But we don't want to follow Jesus. Because following Jesus comes at a cost. Because following Jesus is radical obedience and I don't know if I'm ready for that, Pastor. Because following Jesus comes with radical sacrifice. I have to let go of that relationship if I need to follow Jesus. And I don't know if I'm built for that, Pastor Ashish. Following Jesus means I got to let go of that sin and this sin and this issue. And I don't know, Pastor Ashish, if I can get let go of that. And God is like, you got to make a decision. Do you or do you not want to? Today he's calling you guys. He's calling you. He's asking you what your decision will be.